I will go ahead and, um, and hand it over to our first speaker, um, Danielle from Scholastica. I will let her share a little bit about her role and what she does. Um, and But she will, will be um, kind of covering, launching us into our, our session on peer review today. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Okay. Uh, are you able to see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Sorry. Um, thank you, Teresa, and hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Danielle Fajula. I head up community development at Scholastica. Really appreciate the opportunity to speak at today's webinar. As Teresa said, we're going to be looking at the topic of quality and peer review and how the industry is addressing current challenges on the theme of peer review week. Um, and hopefully my slides will work. Okay. <laughs> so to start out, I wanted to take a look at a quick snapshot of the timeline of peer review and sort of where we are right now. Um, so despite the fact that scholarly journals date back to the 15th century when the Royal Society published philosophical transactions in 1665, peer review in the timeline of scholarly research is still sort of relatively new and was only established since the 1940s. This uh, great article by Hilda Bastian that I linked to um, on this slide goes into a lot of that history. Um, so of course peer review is meant to ensure research quality, but as this comic from Hilda demonstrates, it's really an imperfect process. There are many quality concerns in peer review today, including potential biases from all parties involved, editors, authors, and reviewers, including biases against null and negative results, institutional or personal biases, self-interested data biases on the part of authors resulting in research spin. Um, all of these concerns are, are real and have been mounting in recent years. So of course, this is what everyone is talking about this week and the topic of quality and peer review. And I hope to cover in this presentation a sort of overview of the challenges that we face and how the community is addressing them. So sort of pulling back, what perspective do I bring to this session? Um, as I said, I head up community development at Scholastica. Um, we're a peer review and publishing platform for academic journals. So we do get the opportunity to work with editors, authors, and reviewers throughout the peer review process and have to really understand peer review from all sides to provide the best possible um, software experience for the editors, authors, and reviewers working within the system. So I'll be sharing insights that I've gained from our users in terms of how they're addressing quality and peer review, as well as from following wider community reports and initiatives. Um, and what I hope to cover in this presentation is, again, really an overview of the state of a look at how the industry is addressing some of the key challenges that we see, and finally a look at the future, sort of what could peer review look like with revision if we sort of approach peer review as a, the process um, that it is, is kind of meta peer review of peer review right so i wanted to start out with this quote from john behannon um, you may recall this article it was published in science back in 2013 who's afraid of peer review um, john conducted an experiment he um, called sort of the sting operation where he sent out flawed articles or uh, manuscripts rather to various academic journals trying to see essentially if peer review would work would these journals recognize the fatal flaws in these submissions um, and upholds the ideals of peer review what was concerning is that ultimately he found that more than half of the journals accepted this flawed paper leading John to this sort of question of are we coming to this wild west in academic publishing what's going on if peer review didn't work at these journals. Um, and as a sort of refresher, uh, this is that article um, in science that of course is still available if you're interested to read it. Um, fast forwarding to 2015, we have another very important article coming out from science related to the replication crisis. Um, another study was conducted trying to replicate 100 experiments in high psychology journals um, and it was found that less than half of those studies could be replicated leading to um, much more attention around this question of do we have a reproducibility crisis in science um, so you know we have this concern of peer review not working at journals we have a concern of replication crisis for some it sort of led to this point of well it seems like peer review is broken period 
Um, but of course, there's a question, is it really? And I think, you know, that's definitely what we're talking about this peer review week. So approaching this from a scientific standpoint, sort of with this sort of medical analogy, I think we need a diagnosis. Uh, there's this question of, is peer review upholding the norms and ideals that we want and expect it to? Um, and I think one of the best sort of examples of this, and this is something that Brian Nosek, um, head of the Center for Open Science, discussed at this year's North American ISMTE conference, and I think um, it was such an important thing to bring up and bears repeating, um, is a look at the, um, oh, I'm sorry, actually, I'm, I'm skipping ahead with my slides. I, well, I will discuss that uh, in the next upcoming slides. Um, first, I want to show this, which is looking at um, researcher perceptions of peer review. Um, and when we look at um, perceptions of peer review among researchers and ask, um, is peer review working? There are two uh, recent studies that I think are really um, important here. Publons put out their global state of peer review report in 2018. And then back in 2009, there was the Sense About Science peer review survey. Um, what we see from these surveys is that researchers want to improve peer review. They don't necessarily want to replace it. So from Publons, we saw that more than half of the respondents say peer review is extremely important. Um, but of course, looking at the 2009 study, we see that only 32% of respondents say peer review is the best it can be. So it, it seems that the consensus is we have some work to do, but peer review is an important process. And when it's about science survey, we also see what's expected of peer review to identify the best papers, determine originality and importance, spot fraud, um, and of course, spot plagiarism. So there's lots at stake and a feeling that peer review is important to uphold. Um, so sort of pulling with that medical scientific analogy, I think we have some key questions to ask to try and diagnose the problem. And I think um, these are sort of the three points that um, everyone is circling around this peer review week. I think there are course, other important points. But what stands out as sort of the most important key questions for editors, authors, and reviewers um, is around the question of research reproducibility. Is it possible and encouraged? Um, are journals operating transparently and following core standards? Um, and finally, I think it's important to ask the question of, is equitable access to opportunities and diversity and scholarship apparent and encouraged? Are we bringing um, diverse voices into this conversation and into the solution that's very important and part of quality here. Um, so I think a really timely quote, this is from a Scholarly Kitchen article for this peer review week, um, comes from Chuck Carpenter. Um, essentially what he says is when we're looking at the question of quality and peer review, we shouldn't expect the process to be perfect. That's not the question, but whether does this process yield a better result than might otherwise be expected without it? And of course, looking at the survey of the community, it seems that yes, there's consensus you does um, if those ideals are upheld. So it's sort of just where we are this peer review weekend and this discussion of kind of triaging peer review, the community has recognized the most urgent issues and is addressing them in an increasingly systematic way. Um, so this sort of brings us to our time for revisions. Um, and now this is the uh, study that Brian Nozick from the Center for Open Science discussed at the uh, North American ISM team meeting this year. Um, he looked at the 2007 study um, on scientific perceptions of the norms and ideals that the community aims to uphold. Um, the sort of core norms uh, for science um, that are often put under the acronym KUDOS are these Mertonian norms from Robert K. Merton. They were developed in 1942, kind of interesting around the time that peer review became more established. The idea that science should um, exhibit communality, universalism, disinterestedness, and organized skepticism. So we want science to be objective, to be open within the community, to approach things with organized skepticism, all these important points. In the 2007 study, when asked if they thought that these norms were being upheld, what was found is that scholars all agreed they're very important for the most part, but there was concern that they're not always being upheld, that instead we're seeing these sort of counter norms of secrecy in science, of self-interestedness, of organized dogmatism. Um, and of course, this is concerning for quality and peer review. There's a question of why is this happening? And one of the terms that everybody so well, and, and that really stands out here, is publish or perish, a concern among scholars that there is more and more pressure to put out 
um, more research, which could create a quality over quantity issue, and also concern that sometimes it feels like research has to be sort of tied up in this neat bow and have this perfect story to tell. If the results are null or negative, they're not going to get published. There's this sort of fear um, for scholars, and that's, of course, going to impact their careers. So what can be done to address these issues? And I think it kind of brings us back to the three core challenges that I mentioned before. So starting with reproducibility, I wanted to share some of the developments that we see and how the community is trying to address these problems. And um, going back to the Center for Open Science, I think one of the um, options or the um, systems that they've been promoting that's so important and has great potential is the concept of registered reports. Brian also discussed this at the ISMT conference. Um, essentially, registered reports says that there should be peer review at the time when a design study is developed and then peer review for the final report. So it's kind of flipping the model to make it so that um, the initial peer review and the initial decision of the article is based on the concept of the study, not the results. Um, and as this quote from Daniel Simmons, professor at University of Illinois, uh, displays, registered reports really have the potential to eliminate bias against negative results, which is, of course, a really powerful thing when it comes to quality and peer review. Um, additionally, when it comes to reproducibility, when reports are pre-registered, there is also that transparency component from the beginning where the report is known um, by the community. And adding to transparency as well, the Center for Open Science has these open science badges to encourage reproducibility. So authors that fulfill any of these um, aspects of good reproducibility, such as making data open or pre-registering reports, can get these badges to show that they're helping to uphold quality in peer review. So this is another really cool, I think, and really important development that we see journals trying out. Um, one is the journal from SciKai, the International Honor Society in Psychology. You can see that they have the badges displayed on their website to promote transparency and increase standards. Um, so, you know, we've talked about reproducibility. Obviously, these badges can also help with transparency and standards. If we're making data open, if we have standards that authors can, um, can uphold and be recognized for upholding. Um, there are, of course, other very important core standards that journals should have that institutions, authors, all of the stakeholders in peer review um, need to be cultivating, really. Um, and the Center for Open Science has their top guidelines, transparency and openness promotion. So this essentially takes those badges, um, for example, data transparency, it takes it even a step further with these eight modular standards that journals can uphold and that journals can um, ask scholars to uphold as part of the peer review process. Um, of course, there are also many other standards out there that are available and that um, should and, and can be cultivated by the community. It seems that this is really sort of the duty of publishers, funders, and nonprofits to develop and uphold these standards. So we have organizations like COPE, the Committee on Publication Ethics. We have the Directory of Open Access Journals, the leading open access journal index that has very high standards for inclusion, many of which have been pulled um, into the implementation guidelines. And then, of course, there are resources reporting guidelines um, within different disciplines. So for example, NIH lists the major biomedical research reporting guidelines here um, that journals can require of authors. Um, these are sort of the duties of journals, funders, and um, nonprofit institutions. What about authors and, and universities? Um, really, it seems that as journals and funders and other stakeholders are identifying um, and establishing these standards, it's up to authors and institutions to then know what they are, right? And to be able to identify trusted journals and follow and uphold those standards. Um, I think one of the best examples for this is submit. Going back to John Lyons, who's afraid of peer review, one of the big concerns that he brought up was that in this age of open access, of course, there are so many benefits, but there's also this disconcerting byproduct of the potential of predatory journals. Um, and that is a very real concern. So what Think Check Submit does is provides essentially this checklist to ensure that the journal you're submitting to is sound and to check for those core standards that journals should be upholding. This is something that authors can do um, for, you know, to protect themselves and to benefit the community as a whole. Um, and of course, hearkening back to those guidelines that I showed, authors, once journals require research reporting guidelines and things of this nature, it's up to authors to uphold them. And even if a journal doesn't require it, this is an opportunity for authors to on themselves to use the best standards within their discipline. 
Switching gears, I think another opportunity for transparency and peer review that can help contribute to quality is really preprints as well, um, both pre and post public. So, of course, there are multiple models for preprints. We have green open access, preprints with open peer review. For example, Faculty Thousand has a system like that. The preprint overlay publishing model, um, this is an example of an overlay journal that uses Scholastica, discrete analysis. Um, and this model is the journal actually accepts submissions through um, the preprint server. Um, and then publishes ultimately on the preprint server, usually using digital object identifiers to distinguish the accepted papers. Um, and there's a lot of potential with preprints, whether it's used as a publishing model or whether it's uh, simply used as a way to archive papers publicly. For example, discrete analysis on their four authors page notes that they encourage authors to post updated versions of their manuscripts on the archive if they see room for improvement. And then, of course, to notify the journal of that so that they can update the version of record if those improvements um, are deemed to be appropriate and necessary. So this is really an opportunity, I think, in preprints to take peer review and um, sort of acknowledge the fact that is living, breathing, peer review it may be imperfect at times, and there's always an opportunity for improvement. So with preprints, we can have that sort of very publicly happen um, and acknowledge better quality in peer review. Um, and I did also want to mention, because I think it's uh, important development to be aware of, the Manuscript Exchange Common Approach, or MECA. So this is an initiative developed by NISO, um, along with various um, peer review systems and um, providers basically trying to develop a way to be able to transfer manuscripts between journals and systems to, to have uniformity in the way that manuscripts are formatted and um, greater uniformity in workflows for really two reasons to be able to make it easier for authors to submit manuscripts to different journals if uh, a manuscript is rejected to submit elsewhere. Um, but also, I think really timely to our discussion is to reduce frequency of repeat reviews. So what could happen with MECA is the potential for review reports to actually be transferred between journals. And of course, when it comes to the question of quality and peer review, I think kind of an elephant in the room is reviewer fatigue. We know that there is more being expected of the community, more strain um, for peer review as the rate of publishing continues to increase. So this could be a really interesting opportunity for technology to solve some of our sort of key problems and um, finally, I did want to look at the question of diversity and inclusion publishing, really hearkening back to the theme of last year's Peer Review Week, and that question of is equitable access opportunities and diversity in scholarship being encouraged, um, and is it happening? I think one of the best initiatives around this um, is the Coalition for Diversity and Inclusion in Scholarly Communications. Um, they've released their statement of principles and are now working on a market research analysis to essentially determine the state of diversity and inclusion in publishing right now, where we are and where we need to be. They'll be putting out trainings and resources. Um, I think this is a really important part of the topic of, of quality and peer review to know that voices are being represented um, in peer review and being represented in this conversation of how to improve quality in peer review. Um, and this is a Melanie Joel executive director of SSP. We did an interview with her about the coalition and she said really the benefit of being value is being able to share information across groups to help to increase dissemination and impact the developments to improve the system. So it, this is a problem that many recognize if we can all come together within the community there's opportunity to make great strides. Um, and in terms of increasing diversity and inclusion and peer review, um, some key steps that have been identified, and I think the first one really being the main one, is focusing on making journal articles more widely acceptable, accessible, rather. And this is something that journals can do and something that authors and institutions can encourage as well. Um, so obviously open access is very important, making it so that anyone in the world can read articles, but also accessible in terms of dissemination. If an article is open access but nobody can find it, that's a problem. So this is an aspect of diversity and inclusion that's so important, is ensuring that research is accessible to those that want to read it, to anyone around the world. Um, part of that, of course, is publication fees um, and also taking steps to support ESL authors. So journals taking steps to acknowledge and support ESL authors, institutions provide support to authors. Authors uh, throughout the world 
encouraging um, support for ESL. And of course, there is the question of English as the lingua franca of research, which I think is a separate discussion and a very important one. But um, going back to this question of diversity and inclusion, um, I think that you know, these are some steps that we see that can be taken. And of course, tracking data on diversity and making diversity and inclusion a part of the mission of publishing. Um, so I hope we were able to kind of cover the key points that I mentioned. I think that we've seen sort of where we've been and where we're going. I think right now there is this feeling of sort of triaging peer review and having to uh, very quickly work to try and address um, concerns of health in the system. But ideally, with the work that the community is doing, we come, can come to the point of monitoring the health of peer review and having a healthy system that can be maintained and upheld. Um, and I did want to share really quickly some additional resources. These are more for journal editors, but they do also cover a lot of aspects of quality and peer review on the author side and reviewer side. One we actually uh, co-produced with AJE and Research Square. These are a couple of free eBooks um, that you could find on the Slesco Resources page if you're interested in more resources. Um, and thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to present. Great, thank you so much, Danielle. That was fantastic. Um, I think next up um, who will be presenting is uh, Patrick. So I will hand it over to you. Thank you, Patrick. Great. Uh, thank you very much, Teresa. So I'll just uh, share my screen here and confirm with you that uh, you can see um, my slides. Yes, we can. Great. Thank you. All right. Well, um, I think that Danielle's talk has really set up um, this session very nicely. So we've had a high level overview from her of uh, the state of peer review as it is right now and some of the ongoing problems that, that are seen there. And then some revisions to the process that hopefully will make everything better in the long run. So uh, just to say a little bit about the structure of the session, um, I think we have some fairly high level talks right at the beginning and the end, so Danielle and Damien's talks. And then in the middle, we have two talks by me and by Roma, which are um, a little more detail oriented, more nuts and bolts oriented, and have to do with the day-to-day -day, um, evaluation of peer review or conducting good peer reviews and assessing the reproducibility of manuscripts. So that gives you a sense of what to look like and look for in the next several talks. But uh, I'm really excited to be here. Uh, I think that people, based on the, the questions that I'm seeing, are joining us from all around the world. Um, thank you very much for joining us from different time zones uh, for this session. Uh, so what I am going to talk about here is uh, how to write a good peer review. So this is a topic that many of you are probably fairly familiar with, but I hope I can say a few things that are a little bit new here. So uh, just to lead with what my point here is, um, is that really when you're writing a peer review, you have two separate audiences. And I think that people are primarily thinking of the editor of the paper when they sit down to write a review of a paper that they've been asked to look at. Uh, so the editor primarily wants to know, is this paper publishable? So is it, is it publishable right now? Is it good enough, good enough as it is? Or if it were changed, could it potentially become publishable if the authors were to make revisions? Um, and that then grades into the primary question that the author has, how can I improve this paper before it is published? And, and that is something that's very frequently forgotten in our experience here uh, when people sit down to write peer reviews. So sometimes we'll see that peer reviewers will simply offer a judgment as to whether a paper is publishable or not and neglect to provide information on how the paper could be improved and very often these reviews will forget this third point, which is of interest to both the editor and the author. They want, both these audiences really want to see evidence within your review that you read and understood the paper. Um, that may seem like something that would go without saying, but in practice isn't, that isn't actually the case. So uh, as, in the course of this talk, I'm going to be providing an outline um, that you can follow in writing your peer reviews that if you do follow it, you'll be addressing all these questions all at one go 
and thereby helping your fellow scientists to publish more papers and better papers. And that's something that uh, Danielle has already pointed out to us, this pressure to publish. So, you know, by, by following the model that I'm outlining here, uh, you can help your fellow scientists to be meeting these, public, these, these uh, increased publication goals. So uh, I won't labor, spend too much time on this, but I do want to give you a little bit of confidence that I should know what I'm talking about based on who I am. So I do have a doctoral degree from an institution in the U.S. I have uh, published some peer-reviewed papers, uh, spent time as a researcher, instructor, and scientific programmer, so various roles within academia. And uh, right now I'm at Research Square, and uh, I, I work with a team of uh, up to about 15 people. And what we do is we coordinate peer reviews for open access journals. And we do this at a large scale. So at this point, we've been doing this for a couple of years and we've brought in thousands of peer reviews uh, that have helped uh, scientific manuscripts that might otherwise not have gotten published to advance towards publication. So taking a step back and thinking about your fellow scientists who are writing the articles that you're being asked to uh, review. So what are their goals and how do they line up with your goals as a scientist? Well, uh, again, your goals are to publish um, high quality papers and to publish as many of them as possible. That's at least here in the United States and probably elsewhere is the key determinant of your ability to get the next job or to retain the job you already have. So um, that's your goal, and the people that you're writing reviews for have, have probably the very same goal. So if you can, it, it's nice if you can help these people who, who share so much in common with you. So uh, taking a step back and thinking about how peer review fits into the publication process, I think will help illustrate why it's so important to provide a complete peer review. So as as you realize uh, from your own experiences, you as the author, when, you, when you're the author rather than the reviewer, you're writing a paper, you send it to a journal, and then uh, the editor at that journal, after um, some process that may or may not be apparent to you, uh, eventually makes some decision about whether or not to publish your article or to reject it. Now, I just want to flip this a little bit and think about about this in the case in which you're not the author, but you are in fact the reviewer. So what happens is that the author of the paper sends a manuscript to the journal, the editor takes a look at it, and if it seems broadly okay, sends it to you as the reviewer, you send some stuff back to the editor, and then this process goes like this. And hopefully this, this is all that needs to happen. So this is, a, this is the best possible case for peer review in which only one uh, round of review is required in order for the editor to make a decision on the article. But um, I want to point out this step over here that sometimes is forgotten about when people write their reviews. That is that the author needs to make changes to the manuscript based or has an opportunity to make changes to the manuscript based on the comments that the reviewer has written. So here's one of your opportunities to, to help a fellow scientist. If you're providing comments that help this author to understand how the paper could be improved, then this person can, can, provide, can write a higher quality paper eventually. The other thing that I want to point out is that um, there is this possibility, and I know this, this graphic has become much more complicated, uh, but bear with me. Uh, so this is probably more representative of how peer review often goes. And so this red box over here on the right outlines the part of this diagram in which the author has revised the paper on the basis of the reviewer's original suggestions, but the editor isn't able to determine whether or not uh, the paper now is suitable for publication or not. So the paper the revised paper needs to go back to you, the reviewer, and then go back to the author. And this can happen multiple times. The reason why this is a problem is because every time you have a round of review, the author's publication of the paper is delayed by up to several months. And this really works against people 
in, in terms of trying to publish as many high quality papers as possible. So what I want to say to you here is that, you know, you share a lot of goals. You have a lot in common with the people that you're reviewing for. And you can help these people uh, in a very concrete way by, by providing specific and actionable comments on the papers that you're reviewing. Uh, so if you do this, the paper that is eventually published will be better because the authors will have a chance to improve their work with your feedback. And the other part is that they won't be delayed in uh, publishing their work because the editor uh, will hopefully be able to determine whether or not um, the authors have uh, addressed your concerns based on, um, based on your comments. All right, so I, I now want to get into um, how to write a good peer review. And I think the best way to look at that is what, what, is, what are some sample bad peer reviews? These are not actual reviews that we get in, but keep in mind that we see thousands of reviews every month. So these are, while they're synthetic examples, they're fairly representative of some less than helpful peer reviews that we collect. Um, so you might think that this top review over here on the left would be a good one. This paper is excellent and should be published in its current form. So what does that do? Well, that answers the editor's question, right? The editor's primary question is, uh, is this paper ready for publication? So the reviewer in this case feels that yes, it's ready to be published. Um, however, it doesn't say anything to address the author's question, maybe there are some small things that could be fixed up and this review says nothing about those. And it also doesn't really provide any basis for the assessment that is that is being offered here. So both the editor and the author might wonder, um, you know, has, has the reviewer actually read and understood the paper or did they just skim the abstract and decide it was fine. So um, that is a concern that you should try to allay by following the outline that I'm going to present next. Uh, so what else do, do people write as peer reviews that ends up not being all that helpful? Well, if you comment only on minor aspects of the paper, you've provided the authors with an opportunity to improve their work, or at least its presentation, uh, but your two audiences, the editor and the author, may wonder whether you've understood the science if all you do is comment on minor points of the paper. So um, clearly the science that is being presented is the most important part and your comments should say something about uh, the actual um, content of the paper and not simply how it's presented. Uh, and then this last one, uh, so it's sort of the opposite of the first review, if the authors have used the wrong method to address their question, the paper should be rejected. Well, that is a reasonable outcome of a peer review process, but again, you need to provide more context so that the editor and authors uh, can understand um, why you've come to this decision and hopefully so that the authors can improve their work and eventually publish it. So this is my my belief, you could probably find alternative lists online that would look a little bit different, but a list of things that um, make up a good peer review. So I think it's good to start with a brief summary of the paper, talk a little bit about how the paper adds to the literature. Uh, you want to make sure to answer the editor's question of whether the paper should be published, whether it's in, in its present form or after revision. Um, talk about any problems in the science, if there are any. Uh, then discuss any problems and how the science is presented. These are less important than, than actual problems with the science itself, and so it should come after. And then finally, provide a list of any minor issues that you identified in the paper. So, so if you're wondering, um, yes, these slides are going to be provided to all of you after this webinar. So uh, if you're taking notes, you don't need to write this down. Uh, you'll have it all in front of you very shortly. Um, so the summary, what can you include in the summary? Uh, you know, things like what, what question did the authors try to answer? What did the authors do to answer the question and what are the major conclusions? So uh, it should be quite straightforward to pull this out. Uh, the next point really speaks to your knowledge of the literature 
or what you've been able to glean from the introduction of the paper. Uh, so is this something new or are there lots of other papers that say uh, essentially the same thing? Uh, you also want to assess whether um, the authors have cited important other studies, other important studies in the field. You may know of papers that they've neglected. Um, and if those references are missing, you should say, hey, you should cite the paper by so-and-so. But it's really helpful if you go further and provide an actual citation to that paper. Uh, sometimes it can be a little ambiguous if you simply say, please make sure to cite the work of uh, John Doe, um, because it may not be clear which of John Doe's papers you mean. Uh, so next you're going to answer the editor's question. So is this paper publishable? Uh, is it publishable right now? Is it going to be publishable later? So these are your options. Uh, publishable without modification, needs minor revisions, needs major revisions, uh, not publishable at all based on flaws in, in the science. Um, I'm going to suggest here that you should try to leave out your opinion about whether the paper is appropriate for the particular journal and, and leave that determination to the editor, at least with the um, sound science journals that we work with, um, that isn't a primary concern for those journals. It may be for others. Uh, and then, of course, you'll want to talk about the quality of the science. Can the question that the authors are asking, can it be answered ever? Uh, so is it a hypothesis? A hypothesis must be falsifiable. Uh, are the methods that have been chosen to address the question things that, in fact, could answer the question? Uh, did the authors describe the methods in sufficient detail? Can, could you potentially redo the work on the basis of what uh, has been described in the paper? And then uh, do the conclusions follow from the data? Then you get into um, issues of presentation. Uh, is the structure correct based on what you understand about the journal's policies? Um, can you understand the language? Does it need language editing? Uh, can you read the figures? And then finally, you'll want to provide a list of small issues. Uh, this is usually things like page five, line 20, if there are line numbers, this is misspelled, things like that. That's what goes into your minor issues list. So uh, I'm going to start to summarize here. Uh, think about bad versus good peer reviews. Um, I would argue that most of the bad peer reviews that we get in, the ones where we have to follow up with the reviewer and maybe find a different person altogether to review a particular paper, are the ones where the reviewer has not shown us, shown us, shown the editor and the authors that they've read and understood the paper or doesn't provide um, any comments really that the authors could use to improve their work. So in writing your own reviews, uh, please do include those things, especially because then you're helping your fellow scientists. You're helping them to meet these increased publication expectations that Daniel has already alluded to. Um, so yes, this I'm going to skip over because we've already talked about it a couple of times. Now, if you're um, a junior scientist, uh, or you're someone who is not who is advancing in your career, but you haven't yet been invited to um, be a peer reviewer. I just wanted to offer some suggestions based on our experience of how you can give yourself the greatest possible chance of participating in this process. The need for peer review is exploding. It doubled between 2006 and 2016, according to our data. So um, your chances are really good if you've provided appropriate information to let journal editors find you. So what information do you need to provide? Well, you should have a profile page somewhere on the internet that lists your work. I mean, includes your publications, shows where you work because your institution matters in determining your suitability as a reviewer. Uh, it should include your title and your email address because otherwise no one can get in touch with you um, to ask you to perform reviews. So places where you can do this, Google Scholar, ResearchGate.com, and probably the best option is, your, is if your institution lets you create a web page for yourself, definitely do that and try to keep it updated. 
All right, so I want to make sure to thank Teresa for setting up this webinar. Uh, some of the people that I work with here at Research Square who have uh, really helped form my thinking on this and uh, the, the team that I oversee here uh, who are a lot of really awesome people that I'm glad to work with. All right, I don't think we're taking questions at this point, so I'll hand it back over to Teresa to introduce our next speaker. Great, thank you so much, Patrick. Um, that was fantastic, and thank you um, for the comments and, and question that we received in the chat. Um, as Patrick mentioned, we will um, have a question and answer time at the very end. So, as you're listening, feel free to feel free to type in, and we will definitely get to questions at the very end. Um, so, again, thank you so much for sharing that information, um, Patrick. And now I want to hand it over to um, to Roma and let her share with you all about reproducibility. Everybody hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, fantastic. All right, I'm just going to set up my slides and just bear with me for one sec. Okay. And can everybody see my slides? Not yet. Not yet. Okay, let me try, try this again. Just one second. Okay. All right, how about now? Perfect. They look great. Great. All right, uh, so good morning everyone and welcome. My name is Roma Konecki and I am an editorial quality advisor at Research Square. Uh, part of my role in the editorial services division is to help editors review scientific manuscripts to make sure that all of the details necessary to reproduce a study are provided. And today I'm going to talk to you about how promoting scientific rigor and transparency can help overcome study irreproducibility. So first, what does reproducibility mean? Uh, you know, we've kind of touched upon this a little bit um, in Danielle's talk, but I'm just gonna lay it out there. When we talk about reproducibility, we mean the ability to generate similar results each time an experiment is duplicated. Reproducibility is important because it enables us to validate experimental results. So it's not enough to demonstrate a finding with a single experiment, as I'm sure you all know. In order to verify that a finding is robust, we need to show that it holds true every time the experiment is performed. And when a finding can't be reliably reproduced, then we question its validity. Reproducibility is a key part of the scientific process, but despite its importance, many findings are actually not replicable. And this irreproducibility across disciplines has become known as the reproducibility crisis. Uh, this phrase was coined in 2010 as part of a growing awareness that many scientific studies are not replicable. A number of studies to date have examined reproducibility across many different disciplines and have found that across the board, irreproducibility is pretty widespread. Uh, one example, and this is one that Danielle mentioned in her talk, is a study by the Center for Open Science where they conducted replications of 100 psychology experiments published in prominent journals. And out of 100 replication attempts, only 39 were successfully replicated. A few years ago, Nature took a poll of over 1,500 scientists and they found that 70% had failed to reproduce at least one other scientist's experiment or their own. So it seems clear that across the scientific community, irreproducible research is a major concern. And it's a concern because invalid claims slow scientific process, progress, they waste time and resources and contribute to the public's mistrust of science. So we know that reproducibility is a big problem, but what are some of the factors responsible for this crisis? Well, Nature surveyed 1,500 scientists and asked them just that. Uh, those you can imagine the responses were varied ranging from insufficient oversight to things like bad luck 
At the top of the list, over 80% of respondents cited selective reporting and pressure to publish as a leading factor. Other notable factors cited included low statistical power, unavailable methods and data, and poor experimental design. Many respondents also indicated that fraud contributes to reproducibility crisis, but in reality, these cases are actually pretty rare. However, and perhaps more concerning, some common less rigorous scientific practices are actually more likely to blame. And today I'm gonna to present some of the leading factors that contribute to the crisis and discuss some ways we can improve a study's reproducibility. So here are some common research practices that contribute to irreproducibility. And starting at the top are underspecified methods. Oftentimes, details that are critical to reproduce a study and understand the study's results are not provided. And when these details are omitted, the procedure needed to reproduce a study isn't clear. Underspecified methods are a lot like providing only part of a recipe. So in order to bake a loaf of bread, it isn't enough to know that you need flour, water, salt, and yeast. You need to know how much of each ingredient to add and what order, what temperature to bake the bread, etc. And when these details aren't clearly specified, the quality of the end product will be variable. So just like an incomplete recipe, an incomplete record of the experimental procedures can lead to very inconsistent outcomes. Here's some data from a pilot study that we recently conducted for a journal where we examined the reporting in 77 manuscripts. And we found that in most papers, critical experimental details were not specified. Almost 90% of papers failed to describe how the sample size was determined. Other important details regarding data exclusions, replication, sample allocation, and blinding procedures were also underreported. When we uh, looked at materials and methods, we also found that critical details used in the study were omitted. So for instance, a significant majority of papers failed to describe the antibodies and cell lines in adequate detail and details regarding the software used in code and data availability were commonly not provided. When we looked at the statistical analyses, we found that most papers did not provide important statistical details, including the sample size, the test used, precise p-values, and how effect sizes were estimated. So we've seen from our own experience that underspecified methods seem to be pretty widespread. So like baking a loaf of bread, a scientific recipe should include all the details needed to reproduce a study, such as the materials used, the organisms involved, instruments used to collect the data, and any software, and in general, just the procedures that were followed to conduct the experiment. When we don't have these details, we don't know if an irreproducible finding was due to procedural differences or if the result was simply just incorrect. Issues related to underspecified methods can be alleviated by decreasing journal constraints on the methods and giving authors more space to describe their experiments. We're seeing more and more journals easing up on their methods length restrictions, which can help. Publishing detailed study protocols can also reduce the prevalence of underspecified methods. And we've seen several journals are now accepting study protocol submissions. So this seems to be gaining more traction in recent years. Another factor that contributes to irreproducibility is low statistical power. Statistical power refers to the ability of an analysis to detect a true effect. And the pressure to publish can lead to cutting corners to obtain results more quickly, which sometimes means using smaller sample sizes than needed to detect a real effect. It's been shown that many studies are underpowered and underpowered studies are less likely to detect a true effect and are at a greater risk of being biased because they produce more false negatives and true effects are actually often exaggerated. So when planning your experiments, it's really important to consider the desired effect size to ensure your study is adequately powered. Another level of bias that can be introduced into a study is the omission of null results. The unfortunate truth is that novel statistically significant findings are more likely to be published. This being the case, the pressure to publish can lead to cherry picking of positive results and ignoring negative results. Not only is this sort of biasing not good science, it also prevents others from learning from the null findings and wastes time, money, and resources. So while significant pressures to publish may influence us to polish the positive findings and ignore negative ones, 
it's really important to be transparent about all of the analyses conducted and to report their outcomes. So just because an experiment didn't produce the results you expected, it doesn't mean that it doesn't hold any value. And publication of null findings actually significantly contribute to scientific progress by providing information we can learn from and preventing others from duplicating similar experiments. Another side effect of the pressure to publish are weak experimental designs. So the pressure to publish results quickly and publish them can lead to rushed experiments. In order to produce results quickly, some might consider using smaller than adequate sample sizes, omitting important control experiments, or starting an experiment before the technical expertise needed to complete the work has been acquired. So many researchers feel the pressure to produce results quickly and don't take the time to plan, but by failing to prepare, you're preparing to fail. So do take the time to carefully plan out your experiments to ensure a rigorous and thorough research plan. Related to weak experimental design are technical errors. Of course, we're all human and we'll inevitably make mistakes sometimes, but there are things that we can do to try to minimize them. And technical errors can be minimized by automati automating as much of your workflow as possible. Automation ensures that the procedure is exactly repeated every time, and by automating, you have a detailed record of exactly what was done in case you need to review your procedure. Um, Journal reporting guidelines and checklists can also help minimize technical errors. So some journals are now using checklists to help researchers meet certain criteria when publishing studies, and these checklists can help minimize technical errors. And finally, be critical of your positive results, not just the negative ones. Negative results often cause us to look a little deeper into things um, to see what might have gone wrong, but Positive results are more likely to be taken at face value and not usually put through the same scrutiny. Sanity checks can ensure that the results are real and can be really useful in detecting potential technical errors. The last item I wanna to discuss today is the issue of data dredging and p-hacking. So data dredging and p-hacking refer to the practice of repeatedly analyzing a data set until a significant effect is found. Some examples of p-hacking practices include selectively reporting only significant results, deciding to collect more data only after a significant effect was found, or excluding data after checking its impact on the p-value. So as bad as these practices are, they are unfortunately not uncommon. So it's important to be aware of these practices and to avoid them because they are not hypothesis driven, they're not statistically sound, and they can severely bias results. So before I wrap up today, I'd just like to conclude with a few take home points. Um, as you probably are all aware, irreproducible findings are prevalent and are a major problem for science. After today's talk, I hope that you can see that many common scientific practices actually contribute to the reproducibility crisis. But by promoting more rigorous scientific practices, we can overcome this challenge. And thank you for your attention. Awesome. Thank you so much, Roma. Um, that was really fantastic. Thank you for covering um, a very relevant topic and um, something that I think um, everyone can can kind of take something away. So thank you for that. Um, and uh, I was going to say, I think to our final presentation this morning or today is going to be um, by Damien. So Damien, I will go ahead and um, hand it over to you. Thanks, Teresa. Um, okay, let me just share my screen. Um, oops, sorry, I actually know this is the wrong screen. Sorry. <laughs> okay, can you see that? Yes, we can. Great, okay. Um, thanks, uh, Teresa, for inviting me to speak today. Um, I, uh, as Patrick said earlier, I'll be going back to a kind of higher level overview uh, and follow up on some of the points that uh, Danielle uh, discussed at the beginning uh, and perhaps go into a little more detail around um, some kind of interesting new trends and patterns that are emerging in, um, uh, in peer review. Uh, that we at Research Square are particularly interested in um, and we are 
keen to sort of uh, start conversations and, and some, do some experiments on ways in which we can um, take advantage of the, uh, the new digital landscape that we all live in uh, to, to perhaps expand the reach of peer review uh, beyond its, its usual scope. So that's what I'm going to try and cover today. Um, briefly about me, I am um, a PhD as well, uh, based in uh, the UK. Uh, I left the bench many years ago and uh, became an editor at the BMJ. Uh, I then became executive editor of PLOS One, um, editorial director of PLOS, and then moved to uh, Research Square about three years ago to uh, head up innovation. So I've been very involved in peer review for many years and uh, particularly at PLOS I um, oversaw many many hundreds of, uh, of reviews myself so I think I have quite an interesting perspective on uh, issues I see with peer review and ways that I, which I think it could be improved so that's what I'm going to discuss a bit today. So again to follow up on Danielle's um, survey results at the beginning this one is actually uh, just came out last week um, from Elsevier and Sense About Science. Uh, it's a follow-up on the um, survey that, that Danielle mentioned at the beginning from 2009, asking how satisfied peer reviewers are um, and, and academics are with peer review. And you can see compared with 2009, there has actually been an increase uh, in the level of satisfaction um, from uh, researchers uh, towards peer review. So overall, about 75% of, of researchers are uh, consider themselves satisfied with uh, with peer review um, and only 8% consider themselves uh, dissatisfied. So generally there is still widespread support for uh, the role of peer review in, um, uh, in improving the literature. Uh, digging into that a little more deeply, um, you can see that uh, if you ask the question, peer review, does peer review improve the quality of research articles overall? 90% of, of uh, researchers agree or strongly agree um, without peer review, there is no control in scientific communication. Slightly fewer um, agree with that, 85%, um, but still um, the vast majority agree with that statement. Uh, but interestingly, if you ask them, was your last paper handled um, in a uh, peer reviewed in a timely fashion, then only 66% um, said that they, that they thought it was. Um, and a much, much larger percent felt that their paper was, was not handled um, quickly enough. And that is a big issue with peer review, uh, and one that seems to be growing um, rapidly. Uh, the, the, the time is taking, as more and more papers um, are required to be reviewed, it's taking longer and longer to find um, suitable um, referees to handle the papers, and as a result, the entire process is, is slowing down. So that, uh, in terms of problems with peer review, I think the number one, I think probably most people would agree, the number one problem is with uh, the time it takes to perform review, uh, which really is uh, often uh, painfully slow, as I think every researcher can attest. Um, it's pretty inefficient. Uh, the way that we uh, send papers to different journals and if it gets rejected leads to, uh, you, you then have to send it to another journal and the entire process starts from scratch. Uh, I think everyone would agree is a pretty inefficient way of working and a lot of um, useful feedback is lost uh, because of the journal rejection process. It's very bad at picking up misconduct. Uh, most of the big um, cases of misconduct that have uh, had a lot of publicity recently have been down to um, things that could potentially have been picked up uh, while the manuscript was under, under review uh, but wasn't done so. And it, you know, the reason for that is that reviewers um, are rarely qualified to actually make the assessment on whether uh, wrongdoing has occurred. And it's often difficult for journals to identify. It's very inconsistent. Now this is something, this is more from personal perspective. Um, as I said, having handled many thousands of papers at PLOS One, I noticed significant inconsistency um, across the, uh, the entire review corpus. You had some very long reviews, you had some very, very brief reviews. You would have um, reviews that were clearly many hours of work and others that were clearly only a few minutes. There was um, inconsistency across the uh, time it took to submit the review. There was inconsistency across uh, the expertise of the people looking at the review. Overall, it was a, uh, it's, there is a feeling that it can be a bit of a lottery and I, again I'm sure most researchers can um, agree to the fact that that you're you don't know what you're going to get with your reviewers and you know the infamous reviewer three comments which can be um, completely left field and often completely um, obstructive and uh, and seen as, as as 
unfair. Uh, that's a really big issue with peer review. And it's, and it's compounded by the fact that the whole process is extremely opaque. You often don't know, you rarely know who the reviewers are. It's uh, very hard to see what's really gone on with a paper. And when you see a published article, you essentially have no information around why a, review, a paper was accepted, what revisions it went through, how, how rigorously it was assessed at all. So, um, so these issues are all substantial and I think lead to the, um, the widening issues around reproducibility that um, Rome has mentioned uh, previously. So one thing I've been thinking about recently is how we can perhaps change the question and, and particularly going back to this idea of, um, uh, of inefficiency in review. The problem to me seems that the question we ask now when we're reviewing is this one, which is, is this article worth publishing in this particular journal? And that is a very narrow question to ask. So essentially when an editor sends a paper out for review, this is essentially the, the question that they are, that they're asking the reviewer. Is this worth publishing in this particular journal? Now, if the answer to that is no, it could be no for a hundred different reasons, but the fact that if it, the answer is no, that paper is then rejected, uh, causes a huge amount of the, uh, the inefficiency that we're seeing now. What I prefer to ask is a question more like, like this. Is this article of value to any particular reader? And again, going back to my experience in mega journals, this was something that we were trying to uh, move the discussion towards. So rather than saying, is this, paper, is this article in scope for this particular journal? Is it uh, int of interest to our readers? Is it novel enough? Is it, um, does it represent significant finding? Um, instead, we were trying to ask a broader question, which was simply, is the science sound? Is this something that is publishable? Um, and then I want to take that a step further and say, is there any value to anyone, anyone, uh, in, anyone potentially doing research in this area to, having, to being able to see this paper? And I think if you switch it like that, then the, the, the entire ecosystem changes and becomes one which is much more constructive as opposed to um, obstructive. It becomes uh, collaborative. It becomes much more of an effort to get research out into the um, community rather than trying to stop it. And I think um, that would make a huge difference to, uh, to the way in which science is, is performed. Now this kind of review happens all over the place. I mean, it's, uh, if you look at uh, Amazon, for example, there's uh, customer reviews on Amazon are uh, incredibly widely used and, um, uh, um, and very useful for, for discovering um, the value of things. TripAdvisor similarly has a very um, advanced way in which you can actually assess um, places that you've stayed. Um, and then perhaps on a slightly more um, kind of web-based uh, system, the, uh, the Reddit uh, interface, I don't know how many people are familiar with, familiar with Red, Reddit, but they have a very nice system of uprating and downrating comments so that ones that are of particular interest to a lot of people get moved to the top of the list. So there are lots of very interesting ways in which you can get broad, um, broad level um, input on a paper. Um, uh, and that we can see, we can take examples from across the web of how that might work, but it isn't currently being used in publishing. And that's something that I think uh, is, is a result of the current journal system that we um, are in. However, that is changing. I think there's a very interesting movement at the moment, which is around preprints. Again, Danielle mentioned this briefly at the beginning, but preprints, for those of you who aren't, who aren't really familiar, essentially a preprint is just an unreviewed manuscript that is posted online, uh, clearly marked up as having not yet passed through peer review, but is available for the world to read. Um, and uh, once you post your preprint, you can obtain credit for it. Uh, you can sort of mark your discovery um, as soon, much quicker than if you went through the journals. Uh, you can receive feedback on it and you can get it cited. Preprints are now regarded by most people um, as, uh, as a valid part of, of um, scholarly communication. Um, a lot of funders will now consider a preprint as, a, uh, as an actual um, output um, and you can therefore use it in grants. Um, and so there is definitely a kind of widening adoption of, of preprints as a way in which we can speed up this process and perhaps look at different ways of, uh, of performing the, uh, the review of them. Um, they've been going for a very long time. The uh, original preprint server is the Archive, which uh, was launched in 1991 which is uh, extraordinarily early in the, uh, the, the history of the internet. Um, really one of the, the first places where it was possible to, um, to, to post um, any kind of discovery. Um, 
and has been going along very, very uh, nicely in uh, physics and mathematics for, for since that point, so many, many years, uh, and now has over a million articles, is an um, extremely useful resource for anyone in the physical sciences. Um, but in biology and medicine and the life sciences, it has been much, much slower to adopt uh, until recently, where you can see from this graph that there has been a, um, um, a really marked uh, increase in the number of papers that are now being posted of preprints in the biomedical sciences. And you can see that, as, that this big green, um, uh, green section of the graph here uh, is down to bioarchive. And again, I'm sure most people have now heard of bioarchive as a place where biologists and, and um, medical science um, researchers can come and post their work um, as a preprint. So here's an example of a, of a bioarchive page. Um, Essentially, you, uh, you upload your, your manuscript um, as you would to a, submission, uh, to a submission to a journal, and it's posted within uh, a day or two, uh, so very, very quickly posted uh, onto the web, uh, and people can then read it and uh, cite it. This paper I've picked out is of interest because um, it was very widely commented upon by the community. So a few things to point out. It's got a very high altmetric score. It got a lot of coverage. Uh, both in the news, in the blogosphere, uh, and through um, social media. It was clearly something that was of interest to a lot of people. The, uh, the article essentially argues that the, uh, the problem with the impact factor, the journal impact factor, uh, can be solved by a new way of displaying um, citations through a kind of a distribution graph. And the idea, rather than having a, just a simple mean to um, represent the impact of a journal, you, you can use a citation graph, which gives a much fairer indication of the uh, usage of that particular journal. The article got an awful lot of attention and an awful lot of comments. Um, so I've just pulled one out from the bottom here, but essentially you can see that the first version got 31 comments. Um, and those comments were from people who are well respected in uh, in the area who have lots of expertise uh, and the comments were very thorough they were the equivalent of, of, of peer reviews by anyone's standards and as a result the, the authors actually decided not to publish this paper they decided they revised it in accordance with the comments that they received and their new version was just posted on bioarchive um, and 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 there it stayed they haven't tried to post it in a journal uh, because they feel that they have had enough expert input through the commentary that they received on the preprint uh, to 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 not uh, to, to warrant it not worth um, sending to a to an actual journal. So that's a fairly uh, extraordinary change um, from what we would normally expect of a uh, of a research article. Uh, and I think it's kind of indicative of the way that these things can potentially work. I should point out that the vast majority of papers uh, on the server don't have um, this many comments. Uh, but when it works, you can see that it does work extremely well indeed. So there are a number of different um, projects underway now where people are trying to use this, this growth in preprints to actually try different forms of assessment of the literature. So essentially, rather than relying on the journal model where essentially a journal editor sends out a paper to two reviewers, um, asks for comments and gets a, and sends a revision letter. Um, there are people who are trying to experiment with the preprint model to actually try and expand that research, uh, the, uh, the way in which the manuscript is assessed to, uh, to broaden it out to get a lot more feedback from, from uh, researchers while the paper is, um, uh, or before it's been formally published. So the first of these is called Prelight. So I'm putting the, the um, links down at the bottom here so you can um, uh, feel free to investigate them more. Prelights is uh, from the company of biologists. Um, and essentially what they do, they have an editorial board uh, made up primarily of early career researchers who go through preprints and find ones that are of interest of, to them and basically write a, um, a review of it. So essentially they uh, provide background, they provide a critique, uh, anything that they would like to see changed, and overall they um, uh, recommend the article as one that they would consider to be of interest. Now this, um, uh, if, you, if, you, if your preprint receives one of these pre-light reviews, then that actually uh, a link is put on the preprint itself uh, at BioArchive, for example, and that allows a reader to actually go and see a review of this manuscript um, um, as soon as it's posted. So this one is um, 
uh, this this author here, this uh, reviewer here, has um, posted their comment, and this is now deemed worthy of of the prelites community. Um, a similar model is from a group called Peer Community In. This one is Peer Community in Circuit Neuroscience, uh, but there are many others, especially in ecology and evolutionary biology. Um, but their model is slightly more complex in that you submit to your preprint, uh, to your preprint server, and then you submit that preprint to the uh, community of which you wanted to get um, assessed by. And then that community then has its own way of, uh, of peer reviewing manuscripts within its own, uh, its own framework. And if it passes those reviews, it then gets this recommendation from the peer, peer community in, and it, uh, that is then added to the preprint to show that this is now a valid um, article that has gone through some level of peer review. So a few things to point out, um, they don't actually, it doesn't become published at that point, it is still a preprint, but it has this mark on it. Um, and potentially uh, an author could use that to um, revise and even potentially send it to a journal. <clears throat> um, the, the community also, um, uh, they also post the reviews themselves as a separate document, and this allows people to see exactly what has been, um, been assessed and what, they, what the findings were of the, um, assessment. So again, this is a way in which the community, and this is all a completely community-run enterprise, um, has uh, has kind of uh, formed a way in which they can actually provide peer review without going through the uh, the usual journal system. Thirdly, uh, this one is called pre-review. Um, it's slightly different in that they they aim to provide journal clubs essentially for the. Uh, for peer reviews, uh, for, for preprints, sorry. So essentially you post your preprint and the pre-review um, organizers will assess it and organize a journal club, uh, which is online, it, anyone can join in. And essentially they, they uh, organize a time when people can log into the system and provide a live real-time journal club of this review, uh, of this uh, preprint. The preprint um, review is then written down and uploaded to the manuscript itself. So again, that you get this, uh, this formal record of the fact that this paper has been discussed um, in a, by a group of experts, and these are their findings. So again, another way in which the community can actually um, get involved in the review without having to go through the journal, um, journal route. <clears throat> Finally, I wanted to talk a little bit about what we've been doing at Research Square in this area. So we have our own preprint server. Uh, if you go to researchsquare.com now, you'll see that the, the homepage is now devoted to uh, articles that we've received um, that are posted, um, that, uh, that have, uh, that articles we've received as preprints and that we have posted. And this is what an article page looks like. So there's a few things to point out here. Um, you can see, uh, first of all, that this paper has actually been submitted to this BMC journal. And essentially what we do is that when the, the article gets submitted, we then uh, get sent a copy of it so that we can upload it if the author has opted in, of course. Um, and we then post that on the platform and put the status of the, review, uh, of the, of the peer review um, on the, uh, alongside it. And that's what this peer review timeline shows here. Uh, you can see that reviewers have been invited. You can see that reviewers have agreed. Uh, you can see exactly what happens as the paper unfolds um, and, and, and goes through peer review. Uh, however, we've added a few things that broaden just that traditional peer review. Uh, the first is that you can see here that we have um, community comments, sorry that Arrow hasn't, uh, has moved it, I'm afraid, but essentially we have a way in which you can actually provide community comments. And secondly, we have used the, again, that's gone, moved to the right somehow, apologies, uh, but it's meant to be pointing at this little eye here, which points to a um, um, hypothesis uh, annotation tool. And I'll just show you a quick example of what they look like. So first of all, the hypothesis tool essentially allows anyone to comment on a paper uh, by highlighting text within the article and then adding their question or comment on the side. This is one that I made to a paper um, that's just around the statistical analysis. And anyone who comes to that site, uh, to that paper now, including the author, can then see that there have been questions raised on their paper. They can then, um, uh, which they can then comment upon or even make adjustments accordingly. Secondly, we've built a commenting system at the end. This is a paper, this is at the bottom of an article. Um, I've scrolled down and taken a screenshot. Um, you can see here that this paper has got a number of comments uh, from various uh, different 
uh, people with different levels of expertise in the field. This one is from a medical student. Uh, this paper is around, it was about how Facebook is used in, in medical, uh, teaching of medical students. Um, and got uh, the authors tweeted it out, it got quite a lot of attention, and uh, they received these comments. Now, what's really interesting about what we're doing is because we are engaging with the journals and actually working on these papers whilst they're being sent to peer review, these comments can then be sent on to the editor to actually make up part of the peer review itself. So essentially, when you opt into the um, uh, Research Square platform um, service, you, um, uh, you, you have the opportunity to not just receive peer review comments from the uh, reviewers who the editor invites, but also from the broader community. And that those community comments are then passed on to the editor as part of the, uh, the final decision making. So it's a way of kind of opening up peer review and, uh, and sort of, um, you know, providing new levels of, uh, of, of breadth and, and depth to the way in which the manuscripts are assessed. Um, one thing I did want to say, oh, sorry, no, the, again, this is, uh, this has gone off, this is, uh, um, Apologies, Google Slides has gone funny for me. But essentially what I was trying to show here was a, uh, a kind of a prototype for a new version of review that we want to include in the near future, which is around actually submitting open peer reviews. We're very aware that comments are useful to a point, but that, that review, readers and reviewers generally don't like to um, use these kinds of very informal commenting systems. And so what we're trying to do is incorporate a much more formal peer review system uh, of the kind that Patrick mentioned earlier, where we'd use structured review forms to actually allow uh, readers to submit formal peer reviews and receive credit for doing so. So the next step for us is that we will actually go beyond just this informal commenting and actually build in a system that allows for um, anyone to come in, provide a review on a manuscript, receive the, uh, the credit for doing so, and um, uh, and hopefully improve that paper uh, while it's under peer review. The goal in all this is to essentially go back to a system that is often uh, talked about in, in terms of sort of, oh, how nothing has changed, how this is the uh, philosophical transactions, uh, 666, and um, since then, essentially, the journal world has not changed. And that is true to some extent, except What's notable about the philosophical transactions is that it was a result of a lot of community uh, or sort of society feedback on individual articles. So essentially, when things were submitted to the uh, Filtrans, they were uh, they underwent a kind of community review by other people within the society, and that was the way in which they performed peer review. And to me, that idea is actually so much richer than what we have now, where we just send it to two reviewers and expect them to provide uh, perfect feedback. Instead, what we had is a much broader, more diverse um, set of uh, feedback. So that is the system that I think we can move towards now, but of course, in a very digital world. So you can imagine, as a researcher, <laughs> you are now able to receive feedback from anywhere in the world, from people with all levels of expertise. Um, and that then we're on to a genuinely new way of, uh, of improving and uh, assessing research um, as part of the, the peer review model. Uh, that's all I was going to say. So um, I think I was the last speaker. So I think we're going to do questions now. So I'll pass back to Teresa for that. So thanks very much. All right, great. Thank you so much, Jamie. And, um, and again, thank you to all of our, our speakers for sharing this. Um, just, I was going to say, we covered kind of a variety of topics today under peer review. And so hopefully this is um, really interesting to everyone that attended. Um, and I also wanted to say thank you to those who have begun to um, add questions in the chat and the Q&A section. Um, if you have, I was going to say, as we're going through this, please continue to feel free um, or feel free to continue to add add more questions. Um, so I am going to um, jump in to like in our chat section. Um, and one of the questions that we received, um, they have asked, are there any specific requirements or format for the manuscript to be able to be posted um, on a preprint? Um, it depends on the the server, but generally no. I think um, uh, 
traditionally pre uh, preprints have been uh, essentially a PDF. So the PDF that you um, upload, um, that you submit is the one that is uploaded. So in that, from that point of view, you can use any format. What we've done at Research Square, and in fact others are starting to do as well, is to actually convert those into HTML so that they can be fully discoverable um, and, uh, and indexed. So, you know, I think makes it a, a lot more useful. Um, but even there, we don't really have any um, formatting requirements. Um, it has to be a docx. Um, but other than that, we can deal with, with most um, formats within that. So, uh, so no, the, uh, it's much less um, restrictive, certainly, than the um, than journal submission guidelines. Great, thank you. Um, Patrick, I think this question was submitted um, in relation to, to your presentation. Um, the question or the person asked, is it possible um, that the editor would not agree with the reviewer report and would reject it? I think reject the reviewer report. That's a great question. Um, so, so thank you to the person who submitted that. So um, in, I'm going to ask Damien to follow up with me on this because uh, he has certainly seen a lot more peer reviews than I have. But uh, here I'm going to reach back to my own experience as a scientist. And what I noticed there is that certainly the editor of a journal has the power and authority to say, I think this review is tendentious or incomplete or wrong for one or another reasons and to disregard it. However, in practice, what I found is that journal editors have so many papers to review from so many different fields of study that often don't line up very well with their own expertise that they tend to rely very heavily on what the reviewers uh, say. So uh, it never happened in my experience that um, when I got a peer review that I felt was wrong for some reason that the editor overrode the reviewer. Uh, Damien, what would you say to that? Yeah, it's very rare for a, in, in my experience, certainly, it's very rare for a uh, review to be completely discarded by an editor. Uh, the editor may come to a different uh, overall decision on what should be done with the manuscript. <clears throat> so you often, for example, see um, uh, a reviewer uh, saying a manuscript manuscripts uh, can be revised but the editor deciding that actually overall because of um, other comments uh, they're going to or, or perhaps for scope reasons that they're going to reject it so that whilst the um, reviewer itself uh, review itself provides feedback they um, the uh, the overall recommendation is is different but as I said I can't think of many examples of, of um, a review review actually being rejected for not being um, suitable Great, right. thank you both for that. <clears throat> um, I, I was gonna say, I think this question um, might be able to be addressed by any of our, our speakers, um, but someone has asked, how does one manage the politics of peer review? Um, I can I can have a go at that if you want. Uh, it's, a, it's a really good question. It's a, it can be a very political uh, business. Um, I don't know if you have an example in mind of, of a, what kind of politics you mean, but certainly I think a good editor will always try to, um, first of all, approach people who are suitably objective that, that politics shouldn't come into it. Um, and I think if there are conflicts of interest, then it's up to reviewers to declare them. So for example, if, if a reviewer is uh, in a competing lab or is uh, working on something very similar, then you would hope that they would declare uh, any kind of interest of those kinds. Uh, most review forms nowadays do ask whether, whether reviewers have any kinds of competing interests of that kind. In terms of actual um, disagreements uh, during the review process, um, yeah, it's, it's difficult and they can be very um, unpleasant and they can get very personal. So um, really, I think the editor has a job to make sure that the discourse is always civil. And I think um, reviewers and authors also um, have, I think, a duty to, to make sure that discourse does stay civil. Where that doesn't happen, there are ways in which you can address it. Um, and there are even channels, uh, COPE, for example, do deal with these kinds of cases when they get very bad. Um, but uh, for most cases, um, I think the editor just needs to be able to um, be the kind of objective uh, party there and make sure that things do progress smoothly.
but it's not always easy. Yeah, I can jump in here if that's okay. Um, so, uh, somewhat different angle from from what Damien was saying. Um, so, you know, you can get unlucky in terms of who is asked to review your particular article. So, focusing on the things that are under your control, uh, particularly as a junior person, I think it's hard not to take review comments personally, uh, particularly if the review is not as positive as you were hoping. I mean, you, you put a lot of time and thought into um, your work, and then if a reviewer doesn't like it, that's hard. that can be hard to take. Um, I think it's good to always take a step back and consider how you could use any given comment to um, try and make your work better or clearer. So if a reviewer doesn't, doesn't agree with something you've written, it's possible you simply haven't been clear enough and you could modify the manuscript in some way that would satisfy the reviewer or at least convince the editor that you have made some effort to accommodate uh, what the reviewers have said about your, your paper. They, they are people who have been assessed as having expertise in your area and so um, you know it's always a good idea to make a good faith effort to change your paper to uh, account for reviewer comments. So, uh, you know, if you read the reviews, step away for a week, and then come back, um, you may be better able to engage with the reviewer comments at that point. So that's kind of what is in your control, uh, whereas the politics of peer review, uh, um, while they certainly matter, are something that you may not have any control over. Great, thank you. Um, I was gonna say, did Roma or um, Danielle, did either of you want to add anything to that, that question? Um, the only thought that I've related is sort of from a system side um, in terms of journal peer review processes, I think an important thing for journals and also for authors to look for is clear reviewer guidelines. And I think that this is an area where having standardized feedback forms can be very helpful because it sort of helps to ensure that there's not meandering into unfriendly territory or, um, you know, having reviewers comment on aspects of the manuscript that aren't uh, crucial to the review. So I think that's uh, something that can be helpful. And as Damian said, um, COPE has great things, uh, in terms of having standards as well that I think are really important. Uh, just very briefly, I just want to say, it is actually very rare. I mean, I think there is a perception that this is, uh, that peer review is this kind of war zone. Uh, but in fact, in most cases, it is, uh, it's very well, uh, you know, it, it works very well and there is, you know, very, very useful um, and productive discourse. It's very rare that you get these um, very political situations, but um, it can seem otherwise from the, the press coverage and things and the conversations that happen in labs. Great, thank you, thank you all. Um, for that. Um, Roma, I think this question probably, um, I was going to say it may be best suited for you. Um, this person says, I have a question related to patented materials. When researchers try to publish something related to a patent and a patent and material, what about the reproducibility and understanding materials properties? Do you have thoughts on that? Um, so I guess I'm not quite sure. Is it that you're concerned about all of the details because it is a pat not publishing all of the details of a particular material because it is going to be under patent. Um, I, I think, yeah, I was, I was going to say, I think that is the context. Like, is, is there, um, is there a good way to kind of navigate if a situation like that arises in terms of reproducibility um, and testing for that? Uh, I mean, I think in terms of if you're submitting something to a scientific journal and you're going to be presenting experiments that validate, you know, your particular material or whatever properties that your material is going to have, you need to be, I mean, just like any other scientific paper, you should provide all of the details necessary in order for your readers to understand the results that you're presenting. So, um, I guess that's sort of the, the basis of what you're trying to put together in your paper. Okay, great, thank you. Um, 
There are a couple of questions about um, the preprint, specifically um, how to avoid the possibility of plagiarism and research um, with the with the preprint online. Um, you know, is it a possibility where other authors can copy the content and present it as theirs to other journals? So, what are some, I guess, some ways to to prevent? Um, yeah, I mean that is probably the uh, the biggest concern that people have with preprinting the idea that potentially you could um, post post your work uh, even though it hasn't been formally published and somebody could copy it and submit it to a journal um, and get published ahead of you um, first of all I've never heard of that happening uh, it is uh, it's one of those things that yes it's theoretically possible but I've never heard of it happening and if you look at who who is using pre who is actually posting preprints nowadays it is the top researchers I mean really if you go to um, to bioarchive or somewhere you can see there are um very very sort of uh, senior well-known scientists posting their work there so clearly they are not worried about this the second thing to say is that you um are actually kind of better protected by posting a preprint because essentially it gives you a timestamp. so as soon as it goes up your name uh is is on the it's kind of on the record with your uh the date at which you submitted it so if it then ended up in another journal uh then it would be very easy to prove that you were the one who actually made the discovery and make that complaint to the journal. And that would lead to, uh, to a retraction and, and quite um, serious uh, repercussions for the person who had, before, who had done the um, plagiarism. So I think in a way you are actually you know, better protected from scooping by posting preprints because as, you said, as I said, you get this uh, timestamp. So. Great, thank you. Um, the next question is, as an author, how do I present the paper when I know that most reviewers of my paper will be other PhD students working with or for the main reviewer who is supposed to review it personally? That's a really great question. I mean, yes, we all know that this happens. Um, journals have been very, very slow to uh, to respond to it. Uh, there are some journals now, um, Plus Biology do this, and there, there are others um, where you are actually able to say this was done um, by a student or in, you know, with a student. Um, because you're right, it is, it is very common practice. I'm not sure there are any things that you need to do differently as a um, author necessarily. And you would hope that if it was submitted, uh, if a senior academic had had accepted the assignment then they would at least check the work of the student who did it so hopefully it wouldn't affect your work and and you wouldn't need to present it any differently but um that's my answer. i don't know perhaps others have a thought about that great thank you um, this this question is specifically for you patrick um, this person has asked if i could if I cannot reproduce the experiments of a paper, should I reject it? So um, I think the question is about when you're a reviewer and uh, you're looking at a paper and uh, your conclusion is that the um, science described in the paper is not reproducible. Uh, I, I will just start out by saying that it's not usually at least not in the fields in which I've worked. It's not an expectation of peer reviewers that you will attempt to reproduce the work. Um, if you believe that the science is fundamentally flawed, um, then that would certainly be a basis for rejection. I think that it may be the, the custom in fields like mathematics to actually check the details of proofs and other things. And, and that does verge on um, trying to reproduce the content presented in any given manuscript. But, but normally, if you, you, you're not expected to do that. That would simply take far too much time. Um, but, but interpreting your question a slightly different way, if you notice something that makes you think that, that the science presented or the conclusions are fundamentally incorrect, you should, then yes, you should recommend rejection. Great, thank you for that. Just, yeah, um, just to add to that, that um, you could, if uh, one thing you can do is potentially contact the editor um, outside of your comments to author. Um, most journals have some way in which you can actually contact the editor yourself. So if you're perhaps concerned that that the manuscript is is not being fully honest or is uh, being um, 
somehow cherry picking results, then you can always report that to the editor without having to um, add it as comments to author. Great, thank you. Um, I was gonna say this question um, is, for, is for anyone as well. Um, this person asks, how many times can I approach different journals with my research paper if it was not accepted at the first one? Uh, from personal experience, I can tell you that uh, you can do this as many times as you like. Um, the, the thing that you shouldn't do is to send, so, send something to more than one outlet simultaneously. Um, that's bad practice. Um, but of course, you can post something as a preprint and then uh, submit it to, to a journal at the same time. As we've demonstrated, that's perfectly okay. But, but yes, I, I understand the frustrations associated with getting rejected from one journal and then uh, trying to get it accepted somewhere else. Uh, it, it's good if you do get feedback uh, from reviewers at, at one of the journals to make sure that you incorporate that before you then resubmit the paper because that's an opportunity to improve your work. Great. Um, I will share one last question and then I want to give everyone an opportunity to share any last thoughts or, or kind of closing remarks. Um, this last question is related to preprint papers. Um, and this person asks, are the reviewers in the platform volunteers? Um, are there people to properly do the reviews for preprint platforms? Um, so if you mean in terms of vetting uh, in order to be posted, then we at Research Square, we do that ourselves. We have a team of PhDs who actually do a, a kind of level of vetting to the papers to ensure that we are, uh, that everything is kind of appropriate to be posted. If anything is a, say, risk to human health, if there's anything that we would consider to be, uh, could have negative consequences if it was published, then we would, um, we would not publish it. So we do have a vetting system. But if you mean in terms of these projects that I talked about, such as uh, the peer community and the, um, pre-lights. Uh, yes, that's all volunteers. It's people who are uh, keen to, to um, get, get some more reviewing practice. It allows them to do it on preprints. It allows them to get credit for doing so. So it's a really good way of, um, of learning uh, the art of review and uh, of getting some credit for, uh, for improving manuscripts. So yes, that it's a fully volunteer or, um, organizations. How about the comments section, Damien? Uh, do we do you mean do we vet it or, or? Well, I mean the the folks who are posting uh, comments on individual manuscripts are do we do we know who they are? Uh, no, that is any readers. We have deliberately left it very open for anyone to um, uh, to post comments. We do vet them, but they are uh, but we are very uh, we're keen to have as many comments as possible. So yes, we've left it deliberately very open. In fact, you don't even need to to log in in order to post a comment. Um, anyone can do so. Uh, we're very keen to broaden it up as much as possible. Yeah, but we get I think we get rid of, of uh, comments that, that we find to be unhelpful. Yes, I mean, uh, a, a, yeah, anything that we think is uh, sort of below sort of standards, standards of, uh, of discourse, we would uh, remove. But generally, we, uh, we try to keep as much as we can. Great. Um, so I, I was going to say thank you again to everyone for submitting these questions. This is fantastic. Um, I think this has been a great dialogue. And I just wanted to open the floor very briefly to any of our speakers. If you had any final thoughts, you know, throughout the presentations or the questions that we've received that you wanted to share with our audience. Uh, I, I mean, I would say if, uh, if you're interested in reviewing, then I think Patrick's advice uh, was excellent about making yourself as visible as possible on the web. That's how editors um, look for people. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, make sure you do that and, and try some of these new projects. You know, I really encourage you, obviously, to come to Research Square and uh, perhaps perform some uh, reviews and comments or even submit your own work. Um, it's, it's a very new area. It's very exciting. Uh, and I think the people who adopt it early will, um, will stand to benefit. So I would definitely encourage that.